Welcome back. In chapter two, let's remember that towards the end of that chapter, the Bible tells us that because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who have been tempted. And so chapter three starts with, therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. I am also sure that in Hebrews chapter 12, it asks us right there as well. It says to us actually concerning uh, verse 2, it says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. So we've got to do two things. We've got to, first of all, fix our thoughts on Jesus, and we've got to fix our eyes on Jesus. We've got to fix our thoughts to think like him, and we've got to walk like him when we fix our eyes eyes on Jesus. I love that. So here in chapter three, which is where we are right now, it says, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and the high priest whom we confess. Why? Well, if you fix our thoughts on Jesus, we will experience the grace that is on Jesus Christ, the grace that Jesus gives us. If you fix your eye on Moses, you fix your eye on the law. So I suggest, because the Bible tells us in the book of John, uh, John chapter 1, uh, grace and truth, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we always focused on Jesus. Another reason why we focus on Jesus, you remember that the book of Hebrews is looking at the law and also grace. And here in this chapter, we can say Jesus is being compared to Moses. And so the writer is clearly telling us that Jesus is miles better than Moses. <laughs> Jesus is actually the God of Moses, if you like. In verse 8, it goes on to tell us not to harden our hearts. And we're going to come to a verse um, that I'm going to use to teach us in verse 4. But let's skip over to verse 8. Why? The Holy Sp I love this in verse 7. It says, so as the Holy Spirit says, even though this verse was quoted in the Old Covenant, it says, just as the Holy Spirit says. So, scripture written in the Old Covenant, it's also the Holy Spirit speaking to us. And it says, do not harden your heart. Today, if you hear the voice of the Lord, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert where your fathers tested and tried me and for 40 years saw what I did. This obviously is relating back to the time when uh, Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt and how they rebelled so many times. God said to them at one point in the book of Numbers, I believe, it says to them that those who have sinned against me 10 times, <laughs> they're not going to enter the uh, the promised land. And so only uh, Joshua and Caleb, out of those who are 20 years and older, entered the promised land. So what's that telling us today? Well, it, it, the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah, said you will hear a voice saying, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. And also in the book of John, uh, chapter 16, the Bible tells us that I have so much to tell you, albeit when the spirit of truth shall come, it will guide you into all truth. So we could actually hear the voice of God and harden our hearts against it. Um, you know, so the Holy Spirit is saying to us today, do not harden your heart. Let your heart be pliable. I'm talking to me and I'm talking to you. <laughs> Let our hearts be pliable by God. Let God be able to move our heart. Let God be able to work in our heart. That's why we need to renew our hearts, as we're told in the book of Romans chapter 12. We tells us that do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, is good, pleasing, and perfect will. So we're walking in that as uh, God is enabling us to have a heart that is open, that is easily moved by him. Amen. <laughs> I love that. And so in verse 12, he goes on to say that, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. 
if our heart remains sinful and unbelieving, it will turn away from God. So those people who meddle with sin and just think, oh, I'll get away with it. Every time we're meddling with sin, it is turning our heart gradually. It's very slow. It's a very slow process, but it's turning our heart away from God. It's going to cause us to actually be unbelieving. If somebody is living in sin and, you know, if somebody is living in sin, it is, it is the next step for that person is not to believe what God is saying to them. All right. Somebody is living in sin. It's easier for them to enter into unbelief. And so when they enter into unbelief, they turn their hearts away from the living God. And verse 16, God tells us, who were they who heard and rebelled? You know what? In the in chapter 2, God already showed us that. It says, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first, was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Do you know that when God led the children of Israel out of Egypt, even whilst they were in Egypt, he performed so many miracles. Led them out of Egypt, gave them manna, bread that came from heaven. They even had meat that they didn't have to labor for. God split the Red Sea for them. God went before them uh, in by by a cloud, by a pillar of cloud, and behind them a pillar of, of of fire, kept them warm uh, during the night, and kept them really like in a if you like in a air conditioned <laughs> uh, situation in the daytime. They did not die of uh, excessive heat they did not die by cold god protected them but they still rebelled they still turned away from god why the bible tells us that the reason why they turned away is because of their unbelief they didn't really believe that god could take them up out of the land of slavery to the land of promise wow it says in the final verse of chapter 3, so we see that they were unable to enter. Why? Because of their unbelief. Actually, it was their unbelief that, that caused them to rebel against God consistently. And you will notice when they sent the spies out, the 12 spies, by the way, that was not God, God's idea to send out the spies. If you read the book of Deuteronomy chapter 1, it tells us that the, the people came to Moses and said to Moses, let us send spies. That was not God's idea. God told them to just go in and conquer the land. But they decided they wanted to send spies. Okay. So they sent those spies in uh, Numbers 13 to the promised land. The spies went around and investigated the land, came back with heavy uh, grapes that needed two men to carry on a pole. And they came back with, they said, wow, the land is truly fruitful. Uh, but however, you know, the Anaks are there. The, the, the Anakites are there. So therefore, we are not able. In fact, with our eyes, we seem like grasshopper to ourselves. And also we seem, we look the same to them. So we're not able to go in. Let's go back to Egypt. Egypt was better. At least we sat down there and we ate and we, and we kind of uh, enjoyed ourselves a little bit. That unbelief caused those people not to enter the promised land. All right. Let's move on. Let me show you the lesson that I have for you today. I want to go to verse 4 of chapter uh, 3. It says, For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. What an amazing scripture. And I've got here, the lesson that I have for you today is, let God build for you. Let God build your home. Let God build your marriage. Let God build your business. Let God build your relationships. Let God build your finance. Let God build your career. Let God build everything. God is the builder of everything. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16, it says, 
and I'm going to break into the, oh, I will start from the, from the beginning of that verse. It says, instead, talking about those who God led out, people like Abraham and Sarah, it says, instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. God has prepared something for you. You know, the the older I get, the more convinced and persuaded I am that God has a plan. The Bible says in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says, I has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has planned for those who love him. But they've been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. God has a plan for you. God wants to build something in you. Besides, besides it all, God wants to build you. Because the Bible tells us right here in the book of, uh, in this chapter that we're studying, it says, for every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Verse 6 says, but Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. Then he says, and we are his house. If we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. We're actually God's house. God wants to build us. And God also wants to build for us. Let me say that again. God wants to build us as a human being. God is building you up, making you more like Jesus every day. Plus, he also wants to build for you because he's the builder of everything. Psalm 127. I love this. In Psalm 127, the Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In other words, let God build. God knows how to build. There's things you can build yourself. And God will be working with you to build. But we want a city whose architect, whose designer, whose architect and builder is God. That's what we want. We want God to build for us, all right? And then finally, I love this scripture in the book of 1 uh, Chronicles chapter 14. This is David. This is, this is David who had been ruling for years now. He now came to a conclusion. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles 14, are you there? Okay, let's read. It says, now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David along with cedar logs, stonemasons and carpenters to build a palace for him. And look, look at what happened. And David knew that God had established him as king over Israel and that his kingdom had been highly exalted. Why? For the sake of his people, Israel. Many times when God is building you up or God is building for you, God has a bigger purpose than yourself. God took uh, Joseph to Egypt to actually, not only to work in Potiphar's house, not only to work in prison, but also to be the second in command for, for Pharaoh. But the reason why was God was going to use that situation to preserve the lives of many, to preserve the children of Israel, to preserve Jacob's generation whom he's going to now take out of Egypt to the promised land. God always has a bigger plan, a huge plan that is more than you. So you would be a benefactor of his plan, but God has a bigger plan, one that outlasts you, <laughs> if you like. So David came to that conclusion. So my prayer is that you will allow God to build for you. If God can build for David like this, if you know anything about David, you know how much he loved God, how much he worshipped God, and how rich he was, and how, uh, uh, if you like, what a, an example he was. He became the yardstick upon which all other kings were measured. So those who say that, you know, money is bad. No, David was very rich. David loved God. You can love God and still have a lot of money and, and still live right. David lived right. Apart from the sin he committed with Bathsheba, David lived right. David loved God. David worshipped God. David gave us the word of God. And David had a relationship with God 
that is envious. Therefore, this same David also knew that it was God that had exalted his kingdom. It was God that enabled him to conquer his enemies. I pray for you today, as we have studied this chapter, chapter 3 of the book of Hebrews, that you will enter into what God has built for you in Jesus' name. God bless you. I'll see you in chapter 4.